Hello, all. Can everyone hear me? So uh, welcome to all of our participants and welcome to all of our guests, to all of our friends from around the world, to all of our listeners, to all of our comrades, to all of our colleagues, uh, to all of our enemies and uh, uh, former enemies who will still become friends. Uh, my name is Vladislav Davidson. I am Tablet Magazine's faithful European culture correspondent and a uh, man about town in Kiev. I have been writing about the Ukrainian Jewish relationship since 2012, uh, well before the Maidan Revolution of Dignity, which took place uh, from the autumn of 2013 to the spring, February of 2014. Uh, it was 90 days, 92 days during which the Ukrainian nation threw off the uh, kleptocratic uh, oligarchic regime, which, uh, which was stealing an entire, almost entire uh, GDP uh, worth of, uh, of, of, of the budget uh, in, a, in the two, year, two and a half years that they were in power. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our friends at the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter for helping us organize this uh, very important event. This is the second talk in a symposium that I cooked up with our uh, friend and panelist, Adrian Kratnitsky, on the history and present of Ukrainian Jewish relationship. The previous talk, which I think a lot of you joined us on, uh, happened a week ago, was about the Ukrainian present, about the good things and the bad things that are happening in the Ukrainian Jewish relationship, uh, about the way that Ukrainians and Jews live now, about the, the way that Ukraine has a Jewish uh, well, a, a gentleman of Jewish descent who is the president of a country, how um, numerous members of the political elite and the parliament and the business class are Jewish or of Jewish descent, and uh, the way that Jewish life continues to flourish in contemporary Ukraine, where it is flourishing. But today we're going to speak not about the present, but about the past, and so hopefully about the future. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, also uh, David Samuels, my editor, and uh, my colleague Sa Samantha Hacker, Ani Wilczynski, and Stephanie Butnik for helping us organize the technical capacities for this talk. Uh, and thanks again to the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter for making this, I think, very important symposium happen. Uh, we're going to speak in, I, I would hope, civil fashion, but very controversial, uh, sometimes divisive, and, and always very complex issues. Uh, these are these are issues that have, uh, that have divided the, the Ukrainian and Jewish community uh, for for years, and in some ways they've brought together the Ukrainian and Jewish community in both the diaspora, uh, in America, and in Ukraine. The uh, war with Moscow, Kiev's war with Moscow after Russia invaded Ukraine, obviously is the subtext for a lot of what's happening. It's obviously. Uh, uh, I mean, let's, let's, let's call it the elephant in the room, but there are questions of propaganda, there are issues of, of usage and misusage of historical memory and historical memory issues for uh, uh, contemporary debates and contemporary uh, uh, desires and contemporary uh, needs, some of which are, uh, are positive, some which are negative, and uh, they're always, they're always uh, political. So I'd like to welcome our uh, four speakers. Uh, one is Professor Wendy Lauer. She's the John Roth Chair at the Claremont McKenna College in Claremont, California. Uh, she's also the Director of McGrubbelin Center for Human Rights at Claremont. And she has just put out a wonderful new book called The Ravine, A Family, a Photograph, and a Holocaust Massacre Revealed. Secondly, we will have uh, our only Ukrainian, I mean, not counting, uh, not counting myself and uh, and uh, Adrian Kratnitsky and Rabbi uh, Bleich, who, who's been in, in, in Kiev for 30 years, uh, Andrei Kulikov is going to represent the uh, Ukrainian or Ukrainian uh, majority point of view. He is a gentleman. He's an extraordinarily thoughtful person. He is the co-founder of the Gramatska Radio, and he is the head of a commission of journalist ethics of Ukraine. He has worked for uh, every TV show and newspaper that you can imagine in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, starting with uh, BBC Radio in London and uh, uh, across Ukrainian television channels. He is uh, a very thoughtful gentleman and uh, someone who uh, I, I've always found speaking with about the Ukrainian Jewish relationship to be very rewarding. Then we have Adrian, my friend, my, my comrade, uh, the, the gentleman who put this symposium together with me. 
he is, along with myself, a, uh, a fellow, he, well, he's a senior fellow, I'm just a fellow, at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. He's a founder and, and co-director uh, co of Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, uh, a former president of Freedom House. He has uh, a tremendous experience in Eastern Europe, uh, almost as much as anybody I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, he is a very civilized interlocutor and uh, a gentleman and uh, the very rare person in uh, Ukrainian politics who's read every book and seen every, every art show that I, I've ever thought of or uh, attended. So uh, I'm always grateful to have my friend Adrian with me by my side. And finally, but of course not least, we have Rabbi ya Yaakov Dovbleich. He is the chief rabbi of Kiev. He has served as a vice president of a World Jewish Congress. He is a tremendously wise and politically canny gentleman he understands the nuances of Ukrainian Jewish relationship uh, as well as anybody. And if you ever need uh, uh, to solve any sort of issue that you might have in Kiev, uh, whether that's finding kosher food or, uh, or, or calling whoever it is president of Ukraine, you can just call up Rabbi Bleich and he will, will solve any issue for you because he's, uh, he's, he's fantastic. So, Again, we're going to have a, uh, a, a 20 minute conversation where everybody will have six minutes to say what they want to say. I'm going to ask them a very simple question. They will respond uh, in a very general way. After that, we're going to have a brief round of two minute long questions. Then we're going to have, a, I, I hope, very civilized and very thoughtful debate. And at the end of it, I will have 15 to 20 minutes for our viewers at home to give their input, their questions, uh, this, this being uh, uh, matters relating to the old country, there, uh, we, we will accept no more than two screeds. So uh, let's, let's keep that to minimum. Uh, we're going to start with Rabbi, uh, with Rabbi Bleich, because he is, of course, the chief rabbi of Kiev. Uh, rabbi, can I, can I see you? Are you here? Unmute yourself. You can see me and now you can hear me. Great. Can you, can you just start us off in a very general way for people who do not really keep track of the Ukrainian Jewish present? Very, very briefly, what is happening in Ukraine now? Why is it important? And what is it that people do not understand about uh, the Ukrainian uh, present as, as opposed to Ukrainian Jewish past? You have to be more clear. You're talking about Ukraine, Ukrainian Jewish community, or you're talking about Ukrainian Jewish relations what, what are you are you talking about memory you're talking about Bobby Yao, what are you talking about uh, what do you want to hear or all of the above all all of the above I, I was hoping to to save Bobby Yar because it's, it's a very uh, controversial thing and a very a very sensitive matter towards the end I just okay. want to start the basics for people who do not go and spend as much time in Kiev as all, all these people on this panel do uh, tell us a little bit about the situation vis-a-vis being Jewish and the leader of a Jewish community, and also just slide gracefully into, into memory stuff. Okay, just to, to really uh, have you understand, I could give it to you in a little bit of a historical context since I came to, to Ukraine during the Soviet times in 1990, and I've spent you know over 30 years in Ukraine. So it's obvious that I have a certain perspective of how things have changed and evolved to bring us where we are today. So when I came, just to give you an idea, when I came to the Soviet Union, people weren't thinking of Ukraine as an independent entity. And I, as a, an American Jew growing up in the United States, coming to Ukraine, my understanding of the politics of Ukrainian and Jewish history and history in Ukraine and the Soviet Union was not something that was very, very deep. We didn't study that deeply in yeshiva in the, the school that I went to. Although we did study the history of the Soviet Union, but again, the issues of Ukrainian uh, and Jewish relations were not one of the things that we studied. So I got to learn, I had to be a quick learner. I spent two years in the Soviet Union. And uh, as you know, most of the Jews in Ukraine, uh, well over 90% of the Jews in Ukraine at the time of the, of the vote voted for Ukrainian independence. This is something that was confirmed that most of the Jews wanted to have Ukraine as an independent democratic country separate from the Soviet Union. That's uh, you know, just something that took place on December 1st, 1991, which uh, came into being at the beginning of 1992. So at that time, Ukraine started building its identity, as we call it, Ukraine's Navstvo, right? The identity of Ukrainians 
most of the Jews that were living there were Soviet Jews. They still had the Soviet identity. And to the Western world, we were still Russian Jews. Nobody differentiated between Russian Jews and Ukrainian Jews. I got to learn quite early on in my career the difference between Ukrainian Jews and Russian Jews. And it's definitely, there's a difference not only in the culture of Russians and Ukrainians, but there's a difference in the culture of Ukrainian Jews and Russian Jews. It's there, and I've, I've met with it the thousands of times that I've spoken to Ukrainian Jewish audiences and the hundreds of times that I've spoken to Russian Jewish audiences. They are different. Their Judaism is different. Their Jewish identity is different. And they approach their identity in different ways. So Ukrainian Jews do, ha do have a Ukrainian nuance to them, which I can, you know, it's not, it's not for today's uh, issue, but I just want to point that out. However, the strongest point when Jews in Ukraine started identifying themselves as Ukrainian Jews more than anything else was definitely thanks to, uh, to the Maidan and to, to Putin. I don't think anybody could have done such a good job strengthening the Ukrainian identity of the Jews in Ukraine, uh, the way it was done uh, you know, by, by the invasion, by the Russian invasion, by the annexation, and et cetera, and everything else. There's no question about it that, that brought out within the Jewish community an identity to identify with Ukraine as a country and with Ukrainians as a people, especially the middle Asian youth. Middle age, my mother says anybody that's younger than you is middle age, right? But when I say middle age, I mean I mean people that didn't, they weren't as indoctrinated with Soviet um, uh, brainwashing. The, the people in their 30s, their 20s, they wanted to live a good life. These are people that understand that democracy is good for society and it's good for the individual. These are people that understand that democracy and market economy and freedom is good for, for people and for the people and for the country as well. So suddenly they were seeing themselves not only as you know two different republics, Russia and Ukraine, but actually republics that are going in opposite directions and the majority, like I say, of the Jewish community, especially middle-aged and younger, definitely identified with this, let's say the, not so much the two vector, you know, Russia, towards Russia and Europe, but European Union, that's where, we're, that's where it's at. That's where we want to be. We want to be a part of Europe. We want to have a democracy. We want to, you know, we want to be able to develop the way we are developing and the way we think is the best way. I'm biased here, I must be open with you. I'm an American, even though I'm living in Ukraine for 31 years, I have stayed with a, most of the American understandings of democracy, of, of uh, civil society, of freedoms, of movement, freedoms of speech that I sort of uh, are ingrained in me as, as an American kid growing up in the United States. Even though I'm a rabbi and I went to Orthodox yeshivas, uh, Etc. But I still, um, I, there's no question about it. In, in American society, we understand these things and we value them tremendously. Whereas in Eastern Europe, not everyone has that same appreciation and value for freedom and for civil society and, and for all these things. So the Jewish community today definitely sees itself as a unique part of the Ukrainian community, as the Ukrainian uh, country, nation, Call it what you want, but we definitely identify ourselves as Ukrainians. There's much more Ukrainian spoken amongst younger Jews than one could have ever imagined. I have spoke I spoke to a Jew who lived in Ukraine before the war, until the war, and they would call, they spoke Yiddish, Russian, and Goyish. In other words, the Ukrainian was called Goyish by them. Goyish meaning, you know, sort of, it, the, the word Goy is not a, a, a derogatory uh, word, but it is it just means something foreign. It means a different nation, right? But that's the way they identified Ukrainian as as you know as Goyish. Russian was Russian. And I've heard this from you know from a number of people. So you have to understand that the Jewish community, our school, by the way, went over to Ukrainian immediately in 1992. We didn't wait. The Jewish school in Kiev was the first school to 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 sing the Ukrainian national anthem because I grew up in the United States and that's what we did when I went to school. So at every opening and closing we sang the Ukrainian national anthem already beginning in 1992, uh, 91 actually even, you know, September of 91, we already were doing it. So there definitely is in, uh, within the Jewish community of Ukraine, strong, very, very strong identity and a strong pull to identify themselves as Ukrainian Jews and seeing Ukraine as a country that everyone would like to see as free as possible, as democratic as possible, with a strong of a civil society, 
uh, as possible. That's you know just to put it in a nutshell. And that, my six minutes are up. You're 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 perfect, and you kept your six minutes uh, great. You've obviously done this before, uh, and that is a wonderful introduction to uh, what it means to be a rabbi, an American rabbi, shepherding a Ukrainian Jewish flock, and what it means to be a Ukrainian Jew, uh, of whom there are Thanks several. Uh, next, I'd I'd like to turn the the camera and the microphone, as it were, to Professor Lauer. Uh, where 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 is Professor Lauer? I'm uh, here. Here, here you are. Can you can you start by just telling us about your new book, uh, what it what it covers? Uh, give a give a nutshell explanation of, of what it is the book tells us about, and maybe connected to your previous work on the Holocaust in Ukraine. Uh, thank you, thank you for including me today. I'm actually just thinking about some of the comments that the rabbi presented and. My own. I'll talk about my book, but I'm my first um, trip to Ukraine was the summer of '92, and I was staying with a, a Jewish family in Jatomer and and working with the um, synagogue there that was just reopening. And a rabbi had come from um, New Jersey actually to get that going and was very helpful with my work and and just how hospitable everybody was when I did my research, whether Ukrainian or Jewish. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or even, you know, families that came from um, ethnic German families or Russian families. And, and that moment in 1992 of, of all the expectations and all the hopes um, and, and also the discussion about identity formation and how this all played out over the last decades of extreme crisis, whether it was hyperinflation or unstable leadership, war with, with Russia. Um, but I, you know, my numerous trips since then, I've always gotten incredible help um, from in these small towns that I, where I do my work. So I don't do a lot of work in Kiev, actually. I've always been interested in the various regional, vari you know, the regional variations in Ukraine that have been part of the history and that have been part of how Ukraine has been challenged to become an independent nation and to unify people around these kinds of ideals and values that the rabbi was speaking about and how this process takes place over, over decades, actually over centuries. So I... Um, really intrigued to hear more from my colleagues about this. Um, so in my uh, work on the ravine is um, really the uh, kind of result of um, uh, research on the ground in Ukraine on the Holocaust and going to these sites of mass murder and trying to understand how communities deal with this history on, on the scene, whether or not it's openly memorialized or kind of just understood and part of local memory and local storytelling and what are the stories that people tell around these spaces um, in these different regions and how do those stories um, of suffering and of violence, which is so much a part of 20th century Ukraine's history, whether it was the Holocaust or the Holodomor and the intersections of these stories um, and in, in people's local memory. My first book on Nazi empire building um, really set out to show based on the documentation I found, the German documents that were remaining in your local archives um, the extent to which Nazis understood Ukraine as a colonial project, and that it was not kind of simple, simply kind of an occupation or a kind of military conflict, but that the kind of so-called breadbasket, how much the, the Germans were determined to demographically um, engineer and settle, resettle uh, Ukraine um, and the importance of Ukraine in German thinking. Uh, um, the, and then the second book was on Premishlani, a diary that I um, was presented to me and I worked on for years, a single victim's diary, um, a, a man who actually tried to resist his, his fate um, and was shot by Germans um, in 1943 and buried in Premishlani. And going there um, and going to that site where he was murdered and having discussions with Ukrainians about, you know, where, where should these bones be buried and how should they um, be memorialized and the kinds of um, conflicts that arose in, in that regard as well was part of that story. Um, my other book, Hitler's Furies, also a lot of it started in Ukraine because I started to find in the local documentation that German women uh, were part of this colonial endeavor in Eastern Europe and uh, assisted in the um, uh, as kind of missionaries, as you, if you will, um, in these campaigns, but also bloodied their hands um, and participated in the, in the killing. And lastly, the ravine is about one photograph because a lot of my work um, had kind of explored the issue of collaboration, um, but uh, not fully. And this photograph 
uh, that, that brought my attention in 2009 actually showed Ukrainian militiamen shoulder to shoulder with Germans shooting a Jewish family. Um, and it was taken, very, it's a very vivid image, very graphic, disturbing image. And I um, decided that um, it would be a good starting point for kind of um, analyzing just how something like this uh, comes to be this, this ultimate act of, of genocide, murdering a family. And what happens to families, families that participate in the murder, that witness the murder, that experience the murder, that organize the murder, that whole, that that is the core unit of the community. And uh, maybe we should pay a little bit more attention to the family experience when we talk about genocide. Uh, that's really great, thank you. Uh, I, I, that's really great. Um, I'd like to turn the, the camera over to Andriy, Mr. Kulikov. Uh, you, you are, uh, you are um, a Ukrainian. You are uh, not, not Jewish, as far as I know. You are uh, one of the most thoughtful commentators on these issues that I, I've had as an interlocutor in, in uh, or watched uh, take place uh, debates or speak at conferences. And, I think one of the most poetic things I've ever heard you say was uh, how uh, how uh, touched you were by uh, the continuity of, of hearing lots of Yiddish spoken around Kiev when you were a boy and hearing Hebrew all over the place now as uh, Ukrainian Israelis come back and as Israelis wander around Kiev. So maybe just very generally in, in wide, wide brush strokes, speak about the Ukrainian Jewish past and present as you see it. All right. In contrast to what Vladislav has said when introducing me, I do not think that I represent a majority of Ukrainians and not uh, the views of the majority. I don't know even if it were good if I were representing the majority. Uh, you also have to keep in mind that uh, I'm an ethnic Russian, so in many aspects I'm something of uh, what Rabbi was talking about. Yes, a person with a changing or changed or transforming identity and all this kind of stuff. But this is uh, the sign of our times when people of different descent, including Jews and Russians and whoever uh, else lives in Ukraine begin to associate themselves with the country. Uh, what uh, has worried me uh, for quite some time in uh, Ukrainian-Jewish relations is that from time to time we, and I do associate myself or I do cast myself with Ukrainians, mentally at least, uh, we tend to love Jews more when we feel threatened. For years and decades, we didn't care about the state of Israel. Suddenly, it becomes almost an example or the example of how a small country determined and staunch may and shall protect its independence up, up to the level of uh, idealization of the state of Israel. The reason we've been attacked by Russia. We suddenly start to search for new hope or old hope or the hope that we neglected uh, in Israel. When we talk about uh, preserving the Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian language, we often hark to the experience of Israel as well. Uh, we say, look how they did it, look they didn't uh, switch to the English language, for, for instance, or to the Russian language, while <clears throat> millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people in Israel do speak these languages. Uh, we look at Israel as a example where agriculture is concerned and all this uh, stuff. So Jews and Israel and Zionism are present in our lives, even if on a subconscious level. And I think that one of the 
issues now is to look into the controversial issues. I'm not the adherent of putting controversial issues closer to the end of the discussion, because then we might lack the time to at least try to clarify. If you state the controversial issues at the very start, then you have uh, more time and more ability to discuss them. And if people cannot do this in an orderly and proper way, then <clears throat> at least they will try to learn and next time it's going to be better. Uh, I'm always uh, moved when I'm speaking of these things and uh, I probably told Vladislav and uh, Adrian and the rabbi have heard of this story, but my surrogate great uh, grandfather was a Jew. He was a secular Jew, a typical Soviet Jew who uh, went to the war with Nazi Germany paradoxically, and this is a very tragic paradox, because he was at war, because he was taking part in combat, he remained alive. All his relatives who did not go to war, who remained under Nazi occupation, were killed in this or that manner. That's part of the history that we live. And uh, by the way, some time ago, there was a uh, conference dedicated to Jewish heroes of the Second World War. I think this, is, this was a very, very useful thing. Although if you think about it, there's nothing exceptional in this. Jews are warriors, and many warriors are and were Jews. We have to pay attention to every single detail and uh, Professor Lawler has mentioned here Holocaust and Holodomor, I think. Uh, there are pages in uh, Holodomor that Ukrainians want to single out as relating only to them. I recently came across a uh, study of uh, Holodomor in the so-called Jewish national districts of the south of Ukraine. And there were also Jewish national uh, village councils where predominantly people were Jews. And uh, of course it may look cynical if you start to compare the rates, the mortality rates, but some of those districts and some of those villages were among the leaders as far as the mortality rate in those years are concerned. So looking for things that were and are in common for us, recognizing, by the way, that one, one of the facts is that Ukrainians are much more dependent on Jews than the Russians are. Analyze the Ukrainian language. We have many more borrowings from colloquial Yiddish than the Russian language, or at least we understand, we know and understand many more words about this. Uh, all these remarks are, I think, quite haphazard, but that's what came to my mind in response to what I have already heard. Thank you. That's uh, really touching. And uh, it's absolutely true that uh, the understanding of, of World War II history, both and, and, and the history of Holodomor, are, are, are issues that both frame and divide uh, and, at, uh, and congeal Ukrainian social relations vis a vis Moscow, vis a vis Tel Aviv, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and I've, I've often been told by, by Ukrainians, MPs, soldiers, uh, various people in, involved in the war situation that uh, you know, they find out that you're Jewish and, and, and they say to you, look, uh, we're a small country that's surrounded by a powerful enemy. 
uh, and we have to live like Sparta. And this is uh, this is a trope that um, became well used uh, already in, in the summer of 2014 that I became well used to hearing about. So I, I'm glad to hear uh, Andre say, say something about uh, the relationship to Israel, which I think is fascinating. And uh, we're not here to talk about Israeli-Ukrainian relations, political, geopolitical, diplomatic relations, but they are there and they are important and they frame a lot of other discussions and political situations that are uh, important. So. I'd like to turn to Mr. Karatnitsky. Adrian, are you here? I'm here. Good. I'm and... I'd, like you, I'd like you to just um, frame the discussion from, a, from a, the standpoint of, of a gentleman who's been involved in, in historical memory issues uh, for 30 years. And I'd like you to maybe react uh, uh, to both Andre and Professor Lauer, especially. Yes, I mean, I, I think both the idea of finding common ground, which was a part of the uh, uh, Andre Kulikov's text, and the idea of family histories that uh, Wendy Lauer and family experience and family memory that Wendy Lauer has uh, looked at uh, are a good way of framing the issue and creating a, a greater sense of understanding of everything that went on in Ukrainian territory from say, the, you know, the, 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 the worst parts of the Stalin period uh, from the great uh, terror uh, onward uh, through the Holodomor leading on to, you know, the, what, what uh, of course, Tim Snyder labeled the bloodlands, uh, meaning the devastation caused by Nazism and uh, the war and the Shoah. Uh, just for, understanding, I think it's important to understand that Ukraine and perhaps Belarus proportionally absorbed the highest degree of death, mayhem, and destruction of any part of Europe where uh, the war was the war was uh, waged. And the occupation by the Nazis was uh, equally brutal. Uh, it was it was focused on the extermination of the Jewish population. But if you look at a few statistics, it'll drive home the point. If you look at the current configuration of Ukraine and you look at its population in 1940, it was around 42, 43 million. If you look at the population of the expanded Ukrainian SSR after Stalin absorbed uh, uh, Eastern Little Poland, Shodnia Malopolska uh, and uh, uh, the Galicia, and uh, it, 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 uh, it, fell down to 32 million. So there was a loss of uh, 10 to 11 million souls. Now, a couple of million of them uh, fled, uh, uh, one million of two million Ukrainians were guest workers and displaced persons. Some of them may have been re-deported to Ukraine by the allies or landed in, in the Soviet zones of uh, Soviet occupied zones of Germany and were repatriated and some of them were repatriated by the allies. So the, not all of them, uh, not all of the 10 million loss of population is, is, is attributable uh, to, uh, to deaths, uh, but a large, uh, you know, most of this is an indication of the scale of deaths and the Jewish deaths in that proportion are about one and a half a million. So the family experiences of many and most Ukrainians uh, of the Nazi occupation and of the war are of death and destruction. About three to four million Ukrainian, Ukrainian SSR citizens died in the military uh, conflict, a million more or so as prisoners of, of, uh, of war died in captivity and were starved to death. Uh, by the Nazis, and another three and a half to four million citizens died as, you know, collateral damage in the war, uh, starvation, occupation, uh, all of that. And I think it's important to understand that that could be a source of understanding and empathy, but it can also be an obstacle. It can be an obstacle to indifference because I lost people in the families. What is the special claim of Jews who lost uh, their families. Of course, we understand that there is a, a special uh, importance and significance of the, of the Shoah. I'm simply saying that the fact that 
many inhabitants of Ukraine experienced this degree of mayhem may have made them more callous. And I think that that was maybe one of the, and, and the other thing is that the Soviet experience was to forget about all of this suffering, not, and to, and to elaborate a cult of heroism, which swept under the rug all of these horrors. So then you had a successor generation where parents, much as in the first years in Israel, would not talk about their war experience and the ideology and everything that they learned in schools was on the cult of victory, of heroism, and, and so on. And this, uh, and this, I think, apart from early trials and displacement of uh, collaborators uh, into prisons in uh, Kazakhstan and uh, uh, exile, punitive exile and, and imprisonment and execution, there, and which was done in the initial stages, there was a kind of an amnesia about, about the Shoah, about the Holocaust, just as there was about the Holodomor, which was buried, of course, by Soviet ideology, although alluded to in, in uh, Khrushchev's secret speech. An important speech, but a secret speech, as it were. Uh, so it's only in the emergence of an independent uh, Ukraine that there is sort of the ability to, that Ukrainians have voice and agency, but Ukrainians who are coming to their voice also are seeking heroic examples and so on. And sometimes without full knowledge of the complexity of their history, they look at simple, uh, heroic models. And I think, I don't want to get into a long discussion of the glorification of uh, the, you know, integral nationalists, the Ukrainian nationalists, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. But I think that's, that's part of the issue, that the a nuanced and complex understanding by Ukrainians of their past is sometimes overshadowed, especially now that the country is under partial occupation and, and a war of attrition that Russia is waging. There is this desire to look the other way at some of the shadows of the past and, and to look and sometimes elevate people to heroic proportions or to heroism who probably don't, don't deserve that, uh, uh, that uh, title. But the most important thing I would say is that I firmly believe that one of the reasons Ukraine is rel you know, relatively tolerant for a poor country to, uh, you know, uh, tolerance is not a positive virtue. It's not a virtue. It's not a positive uh, descriptor, but that it is that, that inter-ethnic relations are pretty relaxed in Ukraine is partly because you know, the purveyors of anti-Semitism, the Nazis, left such a trail of mayhem in every family. And the idea of anti-Semitism is counterposed with Nazism and therefore the Nazi occupation. And therefore anti-Semitism doesn't have a great following in political parties. We have a Jewish president. Ukraine has had two Jewish prime ministers. And those were not even issues uh, for the public. So I just wanted to throw all these additional uh, matters uh, into, into the hopper. And I think that those are, they are the building blocks of understanding and, and cooperation. First, understanding the uniqueness of what the Holocaust was and its particular horror that it was for the complete er eradication of a national religious ethnos. But secondly, also a mutual understanding that, uh, you know, and, and as Andre mentioned, that even in the Holodomor, there were tens of thousands of of uh, Jewish lives who were sacrificed and thousands of Jews who were not, uh, uh, you know, either who, who were eliminated because they were religious uh, or, or they refused to absorb uh, atheist uh, communist uh, practices and thinking and were victimized and imprisoned and died in, in captivity. All those kinds of things are part of this complex legacy. But I think that that legacy, complicated as it is, deserves, you know, continued exploration. And that's why what Wendy and scholars are now doing, a lot of the history of the occupation of old Europe, as uh, Donald Rumsfeld <laughs> referred to it, uh, was, uh, was mined already. It's really uh, the, the territories to the east where the Holocaust by bullets occurred in the Soviet, the Soviet bloc that requires a, a much deeper elaboration as a source of great scholarship, but also through great scholarship, great understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That's really great and a really great sweep and understanding of uh, the, the events. Uh, Rabbi, 
I, uh, uh, I, I was watching your eyes uh, and your face as you were listening to, to Adrian. I'm, I'm quite curious what you were thinking and what your response to that would be. Yeah, I mean, Adrian has brought out a lot of very, very, you know, true facts and things that, that, are, that are playing out today. As I said, as I was speaking earlier about the Jewish community, but Adrian is, is sort of bringing out the same idea about the Ukrainian community. The Ukrainian community, as I said earlier, is searching for its identity, for the Samoznovs. I would even go a bit a step further to what Adrian said. I think the fact that the Holodomor was uh, suppressed historically, right? That fact is also what's bringing out a lot of the Ukrainian, uh, I would say, um, you know, strong reaction and strong emotions, strong feelings to what's going on also with the Holocaust. You have to understand the, the Holodomor, I'm not one of the Jews that believes, by the way, as and Andre said before, I think it was he that said it, that the Jews have to uh, monopolize the uh, tragedy or to monopolize the Holocaust. The Holocaust was definitely a tragedy for, you know, for, for the human race. There's no question about it. But I would answer, you know, to what Adrian said before that, you know, with L.A. Elie Wiesel's famous quote that not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. But that doesn't minimize the victimization, the suffering of the individual or the family or the family unit. There is, we can't say because more Jews or Jews suffered more, so therefore your suffering is not important. It's important that everyone has the ability to express what they went through individually, as a family, as a nation, and, and, and these units are very, very important. And especially, again, the, the issue of the Holodomor. The issue of Holodomor is something that was suppressed and it's time has long come that it should be, you know, uh, and it's not being analyzed. There aren't as many scholars studying the Holodomor as there are the Holocaust. For many objective and subjective reasons, first of all, it's, it's farther away, it's harder, there are almost no uh, live uh, witnesses that can, you can get up there and, and do these interviews that the, uh, you know, the Shoah Foundation was doing, etc. It's very difficult. Though I did meet with uh, Jewish uh, people that were, that were alive during the whole of the month and told stories, etc. and everything else. There's a lot that was going on, especially in the 90s, there were a, a lot more survivors. Now it's going to be much harder. It's even difficult to find Holocaust survivors today. So I think that all of this stuff is coming out now, and that's that's really what's bringing us to the issue of the memory today. That when we discuss memory, so the the Ukrainian diaspora and the Jewish diaspora have been at each other's necks for umpteen years already. You know, for many many years, blaming each other for everything and all of the the you know all the things. Even some of the questions I saw somebody put in. You know, I see today's day and age again. Speaking of democracy, civil society, NGOs, people that that are able to respect democracy, and I say this all the time because people don't attack Germany as much as they attack Ukraine. Sometimes I wouldn't say people don't. I'm saying, but I often will get questioned about, oh, you're working in Ukraine, Ukraine. That was, you know, the Ukrainians were terrible anti-Semites. I say, hey, what's going on in Germany? They were the ones that orchestrated all these murders and did everything else, and nobody has that question why you work in Germany. And I think one of the reasons is that the Germans were a nation, the Ukrainians were not a nation. The Germany as a nation was able to get up and say, you know, we condemn Nazism and fascism, everything that was bad. The Ukrainians never had that chance to do that. And now when they've just become a young nation and their identity is not strong enough for them to stand up and start making all of these decisions, all these declarations, suddenly they're being swamped by, first of all, their own internal memory, which is the Holodomor, which was never, uh, properly uh, um, commemorated and studied and, 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 and discussed. The, the, the Chernobyl uh, accident, which is something else that was never properly even you know, studied and, and discussed, but that was a, 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 a real tragedy for Ukraine as, as Ukraine. Forget about that happened within the Soviet Union, but it was Ukraine that suffered from Chernobyl. You had the, the Maidan, you have the the you know the the uh, the best where where Ukrainians are being shot on by their own you know government, which is something that's that's so difficult to understand in today's understanding. Of Europe. These are things that are all swamping and pushing and shoving the Ukrainian people as a nation and sort of washing any other memory. And then suddenly here you come with your Babi Yar, your Holocaust thing, and is it was it a Jewish tragedy? Was it a Ukrainian tragedy? There's so much going on at one time 
that it's difficult to wrap your arms around it. And that, that's my reaction to what Adrian said. I mean, Adrian really put it out, you know, in, in, in very eloquently and, and beautifully the way he does, uh, the, the issues that we're facing up with. But this is the way I see it, you know, sort of coming to a head, you know, one, one and the other. That's great. Thank you so much. Professor Lauer, uh, as, a, as, a rep as a representative of the community of historians, as someone who uh, works dispassionately on these issues, and un unlike, uh, uh, unlike the, the rest of us here, I, I, uh, I probably, I, I'm not sure if you have any particular emotional commitment to uh, living in Ukraine like the four, the four of us do. So I think it's, it's useful to have an, a, an outside perspective where, where perhaps you're uh, uh, you see things a little bit more negatively. Uh, are, are we uh, are are we looking at the uh, uh, too much of a of a bright spots or is? Uh, it... I you know there are several things that um, came to mind as I listened to the rabbi and Adrian and Andre um, that I just wanted to point out. Uh, first of all, on the issue of kind of public memory and public rituals that um, uh, you know demarcate that that. Um, educate, say, say they were the annual um, uh, parades for the Great Patriotic War, for instance, that kind of public activity and the divide between that and private life. Um, and the fact that we have so few <clears throat> sources that really um, portray the Ukrainian storytelling, the Ukrainian imaginary, the Ukrainian experience going back centuries and even till this day, uh, whether they're um, sharing the, you know, their accounts of the Holodomor or their accounts of, of the Bolshevik Revolution, the Civil War, or the First World War, or the Maidan, um, I feel like you know, this continues, this lack of um, documentation and storytelling and collection of that. Um, and um, it, it, it's that lacuna, that huge gap um, persists. And it's really hard to write this history when you have the majority of the population not kind of fully represented in that in-depth, intimate way. Uh, I just was reading the work of Omar Bartov. He's been working on this book, Tales from the Borderlands. And it's just, it's, you know, um, we have this rich tradition, a literary tradition, whether Polish romantic writers or Jewish writers, and we don't have that on, we have the tradition of Shevchenko and, and of course Kulish and Franco, and we have those writers, but compared to other, communities, we just, you know, there's such a lack of material and it really, it's frustrating as a scholar um, because it's just, it's not represented. And then we don't have the complete picture and we don't have that understanding and we don't have that shared, we can't find that common ground if we only get half the story. Um, that was one thing that struck me. And these public, um, during the Soviet period, the emphasis on, on heroism, um, also what was, what was at play was this, um, undercurrent sometimes, um, and sometimes very explicit, of demonization of traitors in the homeland and um, that wedge and that attempt to, um, um, you know, set, uh, divide and rule as it were, typical imperial kind of method. Um, and that was something that has persisted very kind of subtly, whether it's um, in forms of anti-Semitism, but also Jewish um, suspicion of Ukrainians and referring to them as, you know, the worst collaborators. So um, those kinds of um, that, that, that resonates still today in a way. And um, we've had a very, in, in America, for instance, it's been a very difficult last few years as we've had to have these more difficult conversations as we call it, that's the kind of the, the rhetoric now, the discourse or implicit bias or you know, white fragility. I mean, um, these are very complicated um, phenomenon as far as individuals and communities um, really facing and really studying um, carefully uh, the persistence of these kinds of bias and prejudices, you know, the origins of them um, through family storytelling and community storytelling. It happens in a very kind of intimate, private way. It happens in a very, you know, um, the bias in the infrastructure and the institutions and that kinds. So, you know, some of these recent kind of Western approaches to these issues, I think, I wonder to what extent um, Ukrainians today, this new generation, if they're, uh, you know, taking notice of that um, and, and um, maybe that would help in, in bringing people together. Maybe there's something to be learned um, from other, other nations attempts to have these so-called difficult conversations. Well, thank you for that. 
Uh, uh, Monsieur Kulikov, uh, any any thoughts about uh, the state of the difficult conversation and uh, whether lots we... lots of thoughts. And uh, my first thought is was that I wasn't uh, persuasive enough. If Rabbi said that I was uh, uh, implying that Jews were monopolizing the Holocaust, in fact, I said that Ukrainians tend to represent Holodomor as uh, pertaining only to them, while uh, it actually hit at people of other ethnicities in Ukraine as well. What I can say about uh, some Jewish positions about the Holocaust, I may say that sometimes uh, I hear that this or similar things have happened only to the Jews. And this obviously is not true. The scale, the methodology may be, of course, unique, but uh, exterminating people on the uh, grounds of their religion or ethnicity. In fact, Patrick Dubois told me in an interview that uh, those who engage in genocide just want to get rid of anyone who is not like them. But I want to tell you uh, a little story which was prompted to me by the mention by Adrian of two Jewish prime ministers in Ukraine. I had some difficult time remembering who the second one was. And this, and I'm quite sure that half of my friends would say this because we do not judge them by whether they are Jews or not. Volodymyr Groisman, in spite of his surname and all things, uh, I'm pretty sure he was not uh, perceived as a Jew by the majority of people. And in fact, it was only after we started to beat the drum that now we are the only country in the world except Israel that has both Jewish prime minister and Jewish president. We started to pay a lot of attention to this fact. But my story is about another thing. When I was a kid, there were two derogatory terms for a Jew lying around. And one of them is still in use. And some purists even say that we should introduce it into the Ukrainian language as a common uh, term for designating a Jew. When I was talking to a younger colleague uh, two or three years ago, and I said that, uh, well, I was against this. And I also mentioned the second word, which was known to almost anyone when I was 15, 17, or 20. This guy opened his eyes very wide and said, what? He has never heard of this derogatory word. And this is a good sign. That's uh, thank you so much. That's great. Um, uh, let, let's uh, let's speak a little bit about contemporary government uh, initiatives and non-government initiatives to memorialize the Holocaust. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna leave the Holodomor issues to the side, but let's just talk about the Shoah. Uh, uh, Rabbi Blythe, you are involved with uh, uh, one of the one of the projects, the the international project uh, to memorialize the Holocaust. Tell us a little bit about that for just people who don't follow these issues very carefully with uh, a, a lot of viewers here who just may not know what's going on. So very briefly. So basically, I mean, Babi Yar, which is, uh, you know, is, is sort of the symbol in Ukraine and in many places throughout the world. It was the first mass murder of Jews during World War II. Um, according to what we know from Yevtushenko, never had a proper memorial, never had a stone, it never had what it needed is the grotesque Soviet monument that was put up. And then in 1991, one of the first acts that the Ukrainian government did actually after it became independent was uh, to put up the menorah at <clears throat> Babiyar, which was a very, very, was a very moving and a very uh, interesting uh, thing It was done because Ukraine already had declared its independence on August 24th. And this was in uh, the beginning of October, actually, September 29th was a holiday. So it was then at the very beginning of October. Uh, you had the president of Ukraine um, and um, 
a representative from Israel. You also had a representative from the Soviet government there, from Russia. And it was a, a very, very moving and telling moment when Babin Yar was being memorialized by, uh, by a menorah, a Jewish symbol. And, uh, and I think that was, you know, that, that was something that really awakened a lot of memory amongst the Jews, the Jewish community in Ukraine, and I think the world Jewish community. However, that also began the debate and the plan of, okay, now let's create a proper museum so since 1991, this has been going on. Even earlier, there were there were ideas and plans, and there were there were there were different tenders and and competitions for designs by many different people. This has gone on for decades already. I'm living in Ukraine, as I said, for over 30 years. So, you know, the last 30 years, I've been a part of a lot of this stuff that's been going on, including the privatization of the land where the Babi Arhalka Memorial Center is planning to build its museum, which is adjacent to the Jewish cemetery and to, to you know, the whole Babi Yar uh, Zapovednik or preserve. So I actually participated because the guy that wanted to sell the land came to me and I introduced him to the fellow that bought it, the fellow by the name of Alexander Leifenfeld. He was the one that bought that land actually right, with his own money. So what's happening is that after finally so many years, and to be honest, I got to put in a, a piece of personal, uh, you know, thing here. My dream has been and still is to create a museum of a thousand years of Jewish life in Ukraine. That's my dream. My nightmare is the Holocaust Museum. But the dream is to really, you know, get out there. I think it was a thousand years. And we heard it before, you know, that there, there's there is much more Yiddish in Ukrainian than there is in Russian. The reason is because the Jews live with the Ukrainians more than they live with the Russians. There's no question about it. I think out of the thousand years that Jews are living in Ukraine, if you take those 900 or 940 years that were great years and the 60 or 80 years, whatever it is, that, you know, there are historians here that can say better than me that there were difficult years. I think there's so much to tell about this, the history of Jews living in Ukraine that's being overshadowed by many other things. However, before I can get the money together, because I'm only a plain everyday old rabbi, the the wealthy guys got together and decided to build the, the Babinyar Museum, which is something I must say that when it came up, it was, you know, welcomed by, I think, almost everyone in Ukrainian society as an idea. It's only when things started developing that people started questioning, well, what will it look like and what stories will it tell? Will it be inclusive, exclusive, et cetera, and everything else? So here, you know, what the plan is now and, and as far as the narrative is concerned, it hasn't changed over the last number of years. Narrative was written by a fellow by the name of Karl uh, Burkhoff. You know, he no longer wants to identify with it, but his what he has written still is there. And I, I, I honestly and hope rejoin this effort since, you know, when it gets down to the nitty gritty, when they get to the, to the content. Right now, most of the debate is not about the content and the story. It's much more about the things around it. So there are people that support it, people that are against it, people that want it, people that don't want it, people that don't want it at any cost, people that want it at all costs. And this and these people are all debating and dancing around the actual issues. And some of these issues we discussed earlier, there's a lot of memory in Ukraine, a lot of memory, a lot of memory of tragedy in Ukraine. There's a lot of feelings and emotions attached to it, whether it's the Holodomor, whether it's the Holocaust, World War II, the Shoah, call it what you want. And then Ukrainian, let's call it occupation by the Soviets, you know, and then what's happening now with the Russians and the Russian war against Ukraine stuff. So there's a lot of emotion going on here, okay? Unfortunately, Ukraine has had in the last, uh, you know, 30 years, because we're about to celebrate 30 years of independence, the history books in school have been changed uh, four times approximately, because as governments come and go, the new governments come and just throw out all the history books and bring in new history books. I, I'm saying this not so much as a criticism, but just to, uh, to show and understand how uh, the lack of, I don't know if I would call it maturity, it's not so much maturity, but it's a lack of, of uh, available expression of memory in Ukraine, of history of Ukraine. They don't know, and we don't know, how do we react and how do we act and how do we teach about the things that happen, even to us. Even in, I studied Soviet history in, in the United States 
in my history classes, the children in my school in Kiev are not studying that history that I study. They don't know about the actual history. So there's so much, it's such a loaded topic, memory as it is, that you would want you know, all of the scholars to come together and try and come out with something that's gonna make all of the people happy all of the time, which is not gonna happen, obviously. However, from my point of view as a rabbi, as a Jew, as an American Jew, as someone whose relatives came from Ukraine and whose relatives were killed in Ukraine during the Holocaust, I see this possibility now for an NGO, and I'm stressing this as an NGO, to build a museum in Ukraine, not the government, okay? Not the government. And the funny thing is that even people in the opposition today are telling me, no, it should be controlled by the government. I say, really, you want this government to control it? This government can't get their act together with the museum on the Holodomor. They can't their, get their act together on the museum of the Nebes Nesotni, but we should also give them the Holocaust Museum to control. Not to control, but to, to, to regulate. I'm, like I said earlier, I'm an American. I believe in democracy. I believe in civil society. I believe that NGOs are the backbone of civil society. And I believe that if people went, spent their own money, bought a piece of land, spent their own money to build the museum within the, ram the, the framework of the law, existing law, without creating new laws the way we sometimes do in Ukraine to, you know, to affect certain people and certain things. Every law, you know, has Ukraine. We have the oligarch law for this. We have the Kolomoisky law for banking. We have all the, forget about that. Within the existing framework of law, people are putting up a museum that's going to be the pride of Ukraine, as far as I'm concerned, as a museum of the 21st century. It will also tell the story of the Shoah, as far as I, and I'm involved in it, in a way that it has not been told anywhere ever for Eastern Europe. I think that this is something that everyone living in Ukraine and every Ukrainian should be supporting because this is our chance to bring history to a new level, to bring it to an objective level, to bring it up where it belongs. And all of the stuff around it, all of, the, all of the, the, the scandals and all of the questions around it are not even touching the actual memory. They're not even touching the actual people, the suffering. What happened? How did it happen? Let's tell these stories. The, the Babi, Babi Yar Holocaust Memorial Center has come up with historical documents, names of people called Babi Yar, films that were never seen, uh, materials, an unbelievable amount of material just to see the amount of work that was done already and to concentrate on what's being done rather than, oh, I can do it better or someone else can do it better or don't you do it, we'll do it, you can't control it, I'll control it. This is old, you know, old school stuff. The Soviets, yes, the Russians, they had to control the museum. Washington Holocaust Museum is not controlled by the United States. The museum of African-American history in the United States is not controlled by the United States government. Auschwitz Museum is not controlled by the Polish government. If it was, it would have been closed already. Polin Museum is not controlled by the, by the Polish government. It would have been closed already. The only places that these museums are being controlled by government are Russia and secret Hungary, where Hungary got one of their Jews, a government Jew, to give a kosher stamp on whatever they want to write in their history of the Holocaust. And they're doing it, believe me, in a very undemocratic way, very not civil society, not civil way, and not definitely not a way that's going to encourage civil society. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, Adrian, or would you like to respond to that? Uh, as, uh, yeah. as, as I, I fully agree with everything that was uh, said by Rabbi Blythe. The problem is it does not reflect the reality of the project that uh, he is associated with. Uh, as an example, right now, there is pressure on the state property fund to transfer to the jurisdiction of a quote, civic organization, uh, the entire uh, preserve uh, and parklands around the complex of Babinyar, uh, which would be linked to the project of building uh, the memorial. Uh, that said organization uh, is a, a registered civic organization, which was registered in the offices of Alpha Bank, which is owned by the Russian oligarch Mikhail Friedman. S second, the three members of it include the uh, uh, that have 33 and the third percent shares are lawyers for the businesses of several uh, wealthy Ukrainian oligarchs. One of them is the chief counsel to the Alpha Bank. Uh, I don't think this is civic control. And, and I think that's where the issue is. I agree that it should not be a government project. It should be a civic project, which involves the leading moral authorities of Ukraine, 
uh, of the Jewish and Ukrainian diasporas, and uh, you know, with some representation of uh, of donors. And I agree that you know, money has to come from somewhere. It should come partly from the Ukrainian state. It should come partly from the uh, Jewish community abroad. It should come partly from uh, you know, from whoever wishes to. But the governance structures should be primarily, predominantly Ukrainian. Because in all those examples that the rabbi mentioned uh, of the various um, memorials, the majority of board members, if not almost exclusively, are citizens of that country. And the trouble that is created by this is, for example, there is a Russian who is the sort of creative leader of this project, the controversial uh, uh, art, uh, you know, uh, uh, director, film director, et cetera, who was appointed I'm sorry, I do not believe there was due diligence and discussion and various options. It was basically a couple oligarchs in Russia liked this guy's work and they said, okay, he's our boy. And they changed the entire leadership which led to the resignation of uh, the esteemed scholar, Mr. Mr. Burkhoff. I think all the work done by the, sorry? Most of our viewers don't understand what, I mean, we're, this is going a little bit convoluted. Can you just in 30 seconds explain what the crux of the issue well, is? What I'm, what I'm explaining is that there is a problem of governance in this project of to build a, a you know, large and worthy Holocaust memorial. The research that has been funded is worthy. Uh, a lot of information, uh, scholarly research has been supported. There is a good team of, of leading scholars, but there is nothing above it that is a transparent governance structure. And that is what needs uh, to be imposed. And most importantly, it should be headed by Ukrainians. This is part of Ukraine's effort to confront its past. It should be led by Ukrainians. It should be implemented by Ukrainians with the assistance of leading Western scholars, with the interaction of, of leading uh, Western scholars and with the voices of the, the, the broader Jewish community, the international Jewish community. But it should not be driven by three or four guys. There's one oligarch who's just suspended his membership because one, he had Russian citizenship uh, about which he dissimulated as far as I can tell. And two, because he is now under sanction for, we talked about Mr. Yanukovych and the uh, corruption and, and stealing of the Ukrainian uh, natural resources and the energy industry. This gentleman is accused today by the Ukrainian government of having taken over Mr. Yanukovych's illegally stolen assets and he is under sanction. So he's suspended himself. And I think these kinds of scandals will continue to roil a very worthy project until the board asserts itself and says, we want to expand the board. We want to have, bring more Ukrainian partners of moral authorities. We want a Ukrainian chair or co-chair to join Anatoly Sharansky. We want a majority and we want the donors to sit separately as a board of donors, but to have uh, eminent persons and experts on the Holocaust to be making the key decisions of the direction of this uh, worthy uh, project and worthy memorial. I am not saying that what has been done is not you know, in, in many directions worthwhile and a, a building block for a proper memorial. And I'm not saying that anything that was done in the first 25 years, but we're already five years into this project and it is also very far away from, from realization and it's torn in controversy. There's gotta be a better way. It is Ukraine's obligation to, to memorialize the killings, uh, the Holocaust by bullets and the Holocaust and what occurred in Babin Yar and Ukrainians should be empowered and the board that sits there should empower Ukrainians to join into this as a, you know, as a joint enterprise, not one where the real shots are called by a couple guys who most of whose wealth is in Russia and are suspected by many Ukrainians of being at least susceptible to a phone call from Putin to do one or another thing. Okay. Can I just uh, one second? I just wanted to make one thing clear before before we go further. Response down to a minute, and we're going to give. Uh, yeah, just for a minute. I just want to make sure that Adrian, you are the president, former president of Freedom House. Are you saying that somebody is not allowing someone else to put up a competing museum? Is someone stopping others, or do you think that the government should stop these people? Because the way I understand democracy is, and non-governmental organizations, they, they set up a non-governmental organization. Either they'll get what they'll get, whatever they're getting. Uh, is anything illegal being done here, or are you saying that you could do it better? Because who's stopping you? Why can't you get together Ukrainian yeah. society and money and government and do everything in the way that the Ukrainians should do it? You have it all for, figured out, worked out. Why don't you do it? 
I'm why didn't you do it? I don't mean you as an Adria. I mean you as in all of the, the, the critics. Nobody's stopping you from doing it. They tried to do the administrative building they, with government money. They couldn't even get enough money to get it off the ground. They, the, all they were able to do was expand the, the footprint of the building straight onto the Jewish cemetery while screaming that, you know, that here things are being done in the cemetery. It's just that things are so, I see them convoluted and hypocritic when you're talking about, again, a democracy, a non-governmental organization putting up a non-governmental thing. And I beg to differ. The board of the Auschwitz Museum is mostly not Poles. It is mostly made up of donors who have donated money to preserve the Auschwitz Museum. That's what it is. But the Auschwitz so it, Museum and, is and, part and of that's the, what it is. But the Auschwitz Museum is part of the Polish uh, National Museum system. Secondly, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial, all of its board members were appointed by, by the President of the United States. So I don't think it's oh, different. They're different. No, they're, you know, you're right. The America is definitely the old. It's a German institution. And, uh, you know, the U.S. Holocaust Museum a Memorial in New York is a project of uh, New York City. So I, I think that, that the governments are involved. There's no, there's no Holocaust but Museum. I, I don't want to there are all different models. There are all different models as far as how these museums emerge, whether they're federally funded or, right. you know, and they have mixed constituencies. And both the US HMM and the um, African American History Museum, those are on federal land. Right. Um, they are right. federal institutions, but right. the government has no kind of direct oversight as far as, you know, the content and the design and 100%. all these things. That comes together with various groupings of constituents. Um, philanthropy, uh, survivors, scholars, business leaders, um, religious leaders, that makes that process that much more complicated and, and sometimes torturous and frustrating and can be protracted. But it means that you have multiple voices at the table and not a kind of executive decision um, by a small group of people who have their own bias, as I mentioned before, their own sense of what is modern or what is a uh, good technique or what have you. So you know, I, I think it's the, the point is that you have to engage as many people as possible, and it is very messy, and it doesn't happen overnight. But that's how you you work with memory. That's how you bring that out from all those different um, parts of society, and so it's represented, and there's that engagement and that involvement, and that's the democratic process at work, really, in a memorial kind of effort, um, and and it's challenging. Um, no, that's that's really great. Thank you, Professor Lauer. Obviously, this is a, a we're actually right in the mid of uh, in the middle of, of the most controversial part of these discussions back in Ukraine. Obviously, a uh, rabbi and uh, my friend Adrian, uh, both my friends, the rabbi and my friend Adrian are uh, on two different sides of uh, a very complex and emotional argument that's happening in Ukraine. I'm going to give uh, Andri the last word on this issue. I think we're going to expand this. I forgive me, everyone, five more minutes because we didn't give the. Uh, 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 the, the Popolo, our, our, our viewership, uh, uh, a chance to ask any questions because obviously this is uh, this is something that uh, Adrian and I are on the same side. We're just trying to figure out how to get there. Uh, Andre, you're the only one of us who, uh, as far as I know, holds a Ukrainian passport. So uh, please. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, while sympathizing with a lot of what Adrian said, I also uh, share some of the feelings with the rabbi. Because one of the reasons there is so much controversy is a sort of a envy. Because for 25 or so years, we have neglected the need and the opportunity to build a museum, to launch at least seriously a museum. And we were thinking something like, well, let someone else do it. When suddenly, or not suddenly, those someone else appear we start to sort of uh, uh, cry in panic. So I really think that a lot of controversy is borne by those people who squandered the chance to do something worthy before the memorial uh, was started. Uh, although I do admit that my feeling is that there should be a more active participation of the broader Ukrainian public in uh, managing the affairs of the memorial and all this kind of stuff. On the other hand, uh, when uh, I hear some of the 
promises and hopes built on the new museum, I think on the future, on the would-be museum, I think that there may be a trap of falling in, or a danger of falling into a trap of building something for the sake of being the best in the world or the best in Europe or something like this. Uh, some of the architectural forms, some of the scopes, some of the decisions or solutions offered for the museum, they are being even now proclaimed as unparalleled in the world. I don't think that we are there for unparalleledness in this sense. I uh, went to a small town of Berdichev in uh, Zhitomir region. The local Holocaust Museum is not even a Holocaust Museum. It's a small museum of Jewish community in Berdichev. It numbers three or four rooms. When I came out of there, I couldn't speak for quite some time. It was all there within four or five rooms. So I think that we should pay much more attention, as by the way, Rabbi and uh, Adrian say, to the essence, to the uh, content of what we have done to the outward form. Thank you. Thank you all. Let's just take two questions to be fair to the audience. Uh, uh, Alfred Feingold asks us, what is a good place to follow the controversies about the museum in Babinyar? Uh, Tablet Magazine, obviously, and uh, I've, I've written about this, uh, about this issue, uh, and I'm going to write about it again once some of these issues are uh, resolved. They're very much unresolved. The balls are up in the air at this moment, so the story is very much evolving. Uh, that's why uh, I and others who follow the story, there are not that many of us actually who follow uh, the story in the English language press uh, religiously, so to speak, and there can't be more than four or five of us. Uh, I will write about this more when, when the time comes. It has not yet, for obvious reasons. Um, Jerry Friedman writes, do we need another Holocaust Memorial Museum? The rabbi mentioned his quarrel was for a museum of 1,000 years of Ukrainian Jewish history. Look at the Poland Museum. That is a way for the future generation. Uh, uh, True. And, uh, and, and uh, after that, Rabbi, is this the way to go, or do we need a thousand year history museum? Professor Lau? I, I, I do think that Ukraine has the, the Shoah was such a major part of, a major part of it occurred on Ukrainian soil. There has to be a worthy memorial to it. There's just no question. I, I admire the rabbi's uh, broader view, but I think that, you know, this project, which he supports also, there's no reason why there cannot be both in the- Right, right, I, I agree with you. But it should uh, be both. But I think I, this project, I support a Bob and Yar Holocaust Memorial. And I even support, I, all I'm saying is that there needs to be complete board control over uh, all the processes of that museum. Yeah, and I, I, you know, every fourth victim of the Holocaust died on what is the terrain of, of Ukraine's borders today. And people just don't grasp that, they don't understand you know, um, in terms of Holocaust education and memorialization and just basic knowledge. And um, to try to, you know, in a way, not deal with that by saying, well, it's not worthy of a, of a museum. Of course, that's that's a major, that's monumental. Um, and there should be um, recognition of that. And it, and it should be engaging, you know, the entire community. I, I don't know if there's a kind of national museum that can do that or a national ritual that can somehow um, bring people some sort of, um, so, you know, uh, uh, something satisfying, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to achieve that if you think about it. Um, the effort is worth uh, pursuing, um, definitely. I, 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 my feeling is though that a lot of this really should be happening uh, across Ukraine and more regional local activities. Um, I think it's uh, one national museum um, is not necessarily going to be the answer. And what happens after it opens? I think there should be a lot more activity with regional research, local research, involving new generations, involving educators, providing funding in these localities that desperately need it. Um, and obviously to pursue this with uh, the long view, which is a more kind of stable commitment. Um, the, the challenge is that there's been so much instability over the last 30 years um, that it's really hard to kind of, you know, create this 
um, um, in, in, encourage the kind of education and the kind of uh, acceptance of this and pondering of it and study of it takes time. These things don't happen overnight. And one institution is not going to kind of quote, quote unquote solve the problem because it can be subjected to a lot of political manipulation as well. So I, I'm in favor of something more um, kind of grassroots, um, multi-generational, and that results in uh, as much as possible, the collection and the display of as much information, um, stories, um, photographs, documents, all of the kinds of things um, that, that give us that, that basis of history that can easily disappear and make these conversations that much more difficult in the future. That's great. Um, Rabbi, do you have anything else to add? And I mean, three people asked about uh, Jewish relations. Uh, East, East West. Yeah, if, if you have yeah. something about that. Uh, yeah, that's that, that, let, me, let me tell you this. I mean, first of all, I just want to, uh, uh, the issue of the museums, again, I want to say that I agree with what Professor Lauer said now. It's true that you can't, you know, uh, you can't, uh, as we say, you can't get your arms around so much. And Andre mentioned as well to make the best museum and everything else. Sometimes you, you, you compete with yourself. I agree with you. I just feel that we have the greatest chance now with the people that are involved and the money that's there to do what has to be done. I'm not going to answer what, uh, what Adrian spoke about, about the fellow that, that resigned, but I, I think that that's part of Ukrainian politics and anyone that you're going to get anywhere you're going to get. I mean, the, the former president is under 100 investigation, over 100 investigations uh, on Poroshenko. You, you, we all realize that there's a lot of politics that's involved in all of this, this stuff. So let's not, let's not go there right now. However, Ukrainian Jewish relations, again, are a very, very complicated thing. Today, Ukrainians stand alongside uh, Jews and Jews alongside Ukrainians, you know, starting from the, from the Maidan, the, the Jews, as I said earlier, identify themselves with the Ukrainians. So in Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine, wherever it is, there's a lot more understanding. There are much less Jews in Western Ukraine left because of the Holocaust, and many Jews were killed there, and those that came back after the war, many emigrated. Again, so you, it's very hard to classify and say, oh, Western Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine. We like to take Ukraine as one country. We, we are not Russian. We don't want to split and say, oh, the East and the West and the North and the South. We're one country. Within that country, Ukrainians and Jews live very well together. And as we said, a president of Jewish descent who did not, I mean, in the United States, if a Jew was running for president, you would read more about it during the election campaign than you did in Ukraine. It wasn't an issue. It's important to understand that. Jews feel comfortable in a society and is a great society. And it's a society that's developing into a great and strong democracy. This is what's important for us to all to understand and support. And that's really what's going to create the future for our children and grandchildren that are living in Ukraine, is this society. Again, memory is a very big part of it. And I'm not saying let's not look at the memory. And we may disagree and we may agree to disagree. We should get more Ukrainians on the board. I agree with Adrian. We're working on it. We're trying to invite people. However, there, there, there are people not like Adrian that are against the museum at all costs. And they'll do whatever they can to make sure nobody, no Ukrainian comes onto the board. So we have, you know, we're walking on eggshells in all ways. And we understand that it's that you know we're telling a story in Ukraine about Ukrainians and it should be told by Ukrainians. There's no question about it. all these things. Again, I understand everything that that Adrian is saying. However, when the state of Israel was created, the religious community had two ways to to deal with it. They were against Zionism. So some said, let's just fight that Zionist entity, and others said, let's join it and try and make it as Jewish as possible. The ones that were fighting it are around 100 people today after 75 years. The ones that joined it are millions of people because the movement is when you're building, come along and build with us. Come along, join us, build, be a part of the success. The question of who is a Jew was answered by Adin Steinsaltz, one whose grandchildren will be Jewish. In other words, be a part of the history, be a part of the continuity rather than just stand on the side and as we say in Hebrew, it's always easier to be an editor than an author, right? Be a part of the author, be a part of the building. Let's build it and let's make it work. And as Wendy said, we'll never be perfect, but we have to do the best we can and then spread it out, spread it out. There's so much there. We have to spread it out throughout the country and get as many people and as much memory as possible to get those history books out there that are gonna be around for many years and not change them with every president. Thank you all of you this has been a really great discussion 
uh, in some ways much more elegant and civilized than I expected, uh, in some ways more boisterous and uh, energetic than I expected. And uh, I, I'm really very well, grateful I mean, for taking part of your busy lives. Uh, you're all taking part in this uh, conversation sponsored by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter and Tablet Magazine. Uh, I hope to see all of you in the next one. We're going to do more of these in the autumn. Uh, thank you, Andre. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Yes, thank you very much. It's wonderful to meet some of you and be with you today. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think it's great for me. That it was very special to meet you, Wendy. And uh, like I said, I haven't read your book, which moved me beyond words. Yeah, thank And I think that, that you really brought out a lot of what we were discussing here in that one picture. Thank you. I hope I get to meet you soon. I'm oh, yeah. To, I'm going to come to Kiev. I'm, I miss Ukraine. I haven't been to Ukraine because of COVID. And it's, it's I feel this, uh, this draw, this pull. I want to come back. <laughs> I'm, I'm in New York now, so. Oh, okay. You know, all right. All right. All right. We can get together. Well, maybe we can travel there together. That would be That's better. what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Hey, thanks a lot. And thanks, Tablet Magazine, for hosting this. This, is, this was a great discussion. And I, I can end with three words to be continued because we haven't even scratched the surface of what really has to be done here. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye.